Hi, good morning, everyone. I think we can make a start right now. Um, we have to be very prompt about this because like, we have a limited time in this space and we would like to get as many uh, comments and questions from all of you uh, later on. Uh, you are free to take your food and to, to, to eat uh, while the, um, uh, the program is ongoing, um, but we'll try to, be, uh, to start uh, as promptly as possible. Uh, I would like to start this forum uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land, past and present, on which the University of Michigan now stands. Our thoughts also go out to all of those who are affected by the 6.1 magnitude earthquake that has struck the city of Manila and many neighboring provinces this morning. Uh, welcome everyone to this forum, the Philippine withdraws from the International Criminal Court, now what? The forum has been organized by our Filipino postgraduate students and researchers at the University of Michigan with the support of the Center for Southeast Asian Studies, the Wiser Center for Emerging Democracies, Donya Human Rights Center, Michigan Journal of International Law, and the International Law Society of the University of Michigan. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would also like to acknowledge Joet and Sandy Rioma and Oliva Ablan Cooster of the Filipino community in Ann Arbor, who kindly hosted some of our guests over the weekend. Um, I'm Marlon Salles of the Department of Comparative Literature, and my task this morning is to moderate this forum, which aims to present and reflect about the different issues arising from the recent move of the Philippines under the administration of its president, Rodrigo Duterte, to withdraw from the International Criminal Court. Our program this morning is divided into two parts. First, our resource speakers will give a, a brief background, probably 10, 15 minutes uh, per speaker on the ICC and the participation of the Philippines in the ICC. And then afterwards, we will open the floor to anyone who, wish, uh, who wishes to comment or ask questions. Now, some housekeeping rules. Um, we, are, um, we are live streaming uh, this um, forum this morning, and I hope that the organizers will somehow get to uh, display the URL later on, so you can forward it to friends and tweet it and forward it to uh, whomever you want. Um, we also uh, would like to say that, uh, as I've said at the beginning, there will be uh, an event right after, so uh, as a moderator, I will be very strict on uh, the, the times and, 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 and the turn taking during the, the forum. We are honored to welcome the following resource speakers uh, this morning, whom I will present according to the order of their talk um, in the program. So first off, we have Professor Sonia Starr uh, of the law faculty of the University of Michigan. She uh, joined the law faculty of the university in fall 2009 and teaches first year criminal law, international criminal law, and a seminar on the collateral consequences of criminal convictions. Her research interests include prosecutorial conduct, sentencing, law and policy, remedies for violations of criminal defendants' rights, and re-entry of ex-offenders. Before coming to Michigan Law, Professor Starr taught at the University of Maryland School of Law and spent two years at Harvard Law School as a Clemenco Fellow and Lecturer on Law. She also has clerked for the Honorable Merrick Garland of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and for the Honorable Mohammed Shahabuddin, I hope I pronounced that correctly, of the Shared Appeals Chamber of the International Criminal Tri Tribunals for Rwanda and the former <laughs> Yugoslavia in The Hague. Um, next, we have Attorney Justin Sukang. Uh, who has been with the Philippine government uh, since 2013. As one of the youngest appointees of uh, former President Benigno Aquino III, he was a concurrent commissioner and officer in charge of the Legal uh, Education Board, LEB, the government body that regulates law schools all over the country. After pa passing the 2014 bar examination in the Philippines and ending his term in the LEB, he joined the office of the president uh, of the Philippines in May 2015 to pursue policy work as technical assistant. He handled matters concerning public infrastructure, economic development, government-owned and controlled corporations, and national security. After serving two Philippine presidents, Attorney Sukang left the OP as Director 3. He is also a part-time faculty member of the De La Salle University College of Law in the Philippines um, and, and the Commercial Law Department under the DLSU uh, Ramon V. Del Rosario Senior College of Business. Our third resource speaker is Attorney Tom Temprosa. 
who is a Michigan Growth Youth Fellow and an SJD candidate at the University of Michigan Law School, where he also completed his Master of Law degrees in 2017 as a DeWitt Scholar. He was also a Salzburg Cutler Fellow representing the law school in an international law global seminar. In the same year, he got the S. James Anaya Award for Excellence in International Legal Scholarship. He's a faculty member of the Ateneo de Manila University Law School and a lecturer at the Far Eastern University Institute of the Philippines, also in Manila. Prior to coming to Michigan, he has worked for the United Nations and the Philippine government. He was legal advisor to the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines and was designated as its uh, legal counsel before the Philippine Supreme Court. Our fourth resource speaker is Professor Ligaya Lindio McGovern, who is Professor of Sociology and co-founder of the Office for Sustainability at Indiana University. A recipient of a Fulbright Research Scholar Award in 2017, uh, Professor McGovern conducted research on the impacts of extractive corporate mining on indigenous peoples in the Philippines and its implications toward an integrated framing of human rights and sustainability. He is, uh, she is in the process of completing a book about this research, which will add to an already extensive and Im impressive list of publications on women and neoliberal globalization. She is one of the national conveners of the Malaya movement, which I'm sure she will be able to talk about uh, later, and is an elected vice chairperson of Gabriela Chicago, uh, Chicago, a women's, uh, a women's group linked to uh, the women's movement in the Philippines led by, the, uh, by Gabriela Philippines. And finally, we have uh, Professor Steven Ratner, the Bruno Sima um, colleg Collegiate Professor of Law, uh, who came to uh, Michigan Law in 2004 from the University of Texas Law School. He's teaching and research focus on public international law and on a range of challenges facing governments and international institutions since the Cold War, including territorial disputes, counterterrorism strategies, ethnic conflict, state and corporate duties regarding foreign investment, and accountability for human rights violations. Uh, Professor Ratner has written and lectured extensively on the law of war, and also is interested in the intersection of international law and moral philosophy and other theoretical issues. He has served many international organizations, including the US State Department, the United Nations, and the International Committee of the Red Cross, and has advised governments, NGOs, and international organizations on a range of international law issues. So without further ado, I give the floor to our speakers. Hi. Um, I'm Sonia Starr. Um, so uh, again, I'm from the law school. I teach international criminal law there. And so what I'm going to talk about, um, like my, my role here is to talk about the International Criminal Court and to give some background on it for those of you who um, don't know uh, the, uh, that much about it. I, I, I know less than our other speakers and probably less than many of you about the Philippines. And so I'm going to, um, I hope to learn more today and to speak only in the, the simplest terms about the, the Philippines uh, situation. Um, so um, what is the International Criminal Court? Well, um, so it's an international court that has jurisdiction over international crimes. Um, and um, there's some precedent for this. The, uh, it follows in the wake of the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals that came um, after World War II um, and uh, some temporary situation-specific tribunals um, uh, that have been created in the modern era, including the Rwanda um, and Yugoslavia tribunals. Um, the International Criminal Court is uh, hopefully a permanent international court, um, and um, it's uh, jurisdiction is not tied to particular situations. It is intended at least potentially to be global with some limitations um, based on uh, which states have joined the, um, uh, the, um, the treaty or not. Um, so where does it get its power? Well, it's a creation of a treaty, right? So um, a bunch of states voluntarily chose um, to, uh, to create this court and to give it the power um, to prosecute um, certain crimes. Um, so how does it get, how do situations, um, particular situations in the world, land in front of the international court? So the, the treaty that created it, which is called the Rome Statute, 
outlines three methods by which courts can get there. One is if the United Nations Security Council refers a case. Um, this is a difficult route because any permanent member of the, um, of the Security Council can veto um, a referral. And so it's only uh, the cases that really can get um, kind of universal uh, agreement among the world's um, great powers um, that, can, uh, that can get there. Um, the other two methods are based on the state itself consenting to the, um, to the jurisdiction um, of the court. And that can be based by uh, based on this particular situation, that is a court can, or a state can refer, uh, can ask this court to step in when there are crimes taking place on its own territory or involving its own citizens. Um, and that has happened sometimes, usually when there's, when the crimes are being committed like by a rebel group, for example. Um, and then um, the third method, and this is the method that's relevant to the Philippines case, um, is um, uh, is when the ICC prosecutor initiates it um, herself, um, and that is um, the power to do that is constrained based on which states have actually joined, like become parties to the Rome Statute, the treaty um, creating the tribunal, um, and so. Um, in order to take jurisdiction over a particular um, uh, situation, a set of crimes, um, there, one of two states has to be uh, uh, has to be party to the statute. It's either got to be the state where the crimes took place. This is the most common. It's called territorial jurisdiction, um, or it's got to be the state of the defendant's nationality. Um, in many situations, such as the Philippines, those are going to be the, the same state generally. Um, and so, um, so basically, um, in the Philippines situation, the reason that the prosecutor could, um, of the ICC could potentially um, uh, initiate prosecutions is because um, the Philippines was, um, for a number of years, party to the ICC statute. Um, here is the, the world map. This precedes the withdrawal of the Philippines. Um, the, the world map of who has joined the ICC. So you can see it's um, uniformly subscribed to in Western Europe and, and um, South America, um, spottier elsewhere in the world, especially in Asia, actually. The, the Philippines was, um, was uh, unusual in Asia for having joined um, in, the, um, in, in the first place. Um, so most of the countries in the world have joined, but a lot of the, the, the biggest, most populous, and most powerful countries in the world, including the United States, have not joined. Um, so um, how do you join? Well, you ratify the Rome Statute of, um, uh, of the ICC. Um, the Philippines did this in, in 2001, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, the um, treaty took effect when um, the Rome Statute um, got enough signatories, which was in 2003. Um, and, um, I, and, then, and when you ratify, that's basically consenting to, um, to the court's jurisdiction for crimes from that point forward. It doesn't apply retroactively to crimes um, committed before that. Um, so the Rome Statute um, ha does provide for withdrawal from it. Um, so it's not like unheard of that this would happen. The Philippines is the second state to withdraw from, um, from the ICC. Um, so, the, um, so Article 127 provides that a state can withdraw from the ICC by notifying the United Nations Secretary General. And um, there's no particular specification as to what domestic process has to be gone through. Um, um, the, it's generally the head of state or someone with authority to act on behalf of the state who notifies the security general uh, or the, the, the secretary general, and then it is um, effective one year later. Um, and so, at the point of withdrawal, um, it terminates that consent-based jurisdiction, right, um, um, over over things that arise in the future. Um, but it doesn't retroactively strip the court's jurisdiction over crimes that occurred during the period um, when uh, the state was party to the statute. So here are some um, key dates here. Oh wait, I said 2001, but I meant 2011. It doesn't really matter for this purpose because the, um, uh, so the Philippines joined in 2011 um, and the, um, and then um, the, 
Uh, in 2016 is when the events began that are the subject of the complaints be, um, before, the, uh, uh, before the court. Um, the Office of the Prosecutor received over 50 complaints from different organizations about, um, uh, about um, killings, uh, extrajudicial killings happening in the Philippines. Um, and they um, initiated what's called the preliminary examination stage, which I'll talk more about um, in a minute. Um, on February 8th, 2018. Um, and um, presumably in direct response to that, um, the Philippines notified the Secretary General of um, its withdrawal from the Rome Statute um, on March 17th um, of 2018, which meant that one year later, um, about a month ago, uh, that withdrawal um, took effect. So um, effectively between, so. In, in theory, the ICC's jurisdiction can cover anything from August 30th, 2011 through March 17th, 2019. In practice, it's probably 2016 through um, 2019, but if any uh, evidence comes up of crimes that took place a little bit earlier than that, um, it, should be, um, it should be covered. Um, now, I think the continuing jurisdiction probably should not cover, even, w probably will be interpreted not to cover any subsequent events after March um, 17th of this year. Um, I, I will say the, um, there's a white paper from, um, a, that is a, a policy paper from the, um, the uh, Office of the Prosecutor um, commenting on its preliminary examination of the, um, of the Philippines case. And they have a line in it in which they say um, that uh, the, uh, I don't know, I can remember exactly the language, but the suggestion is that so long as the situation, so long as the subsequent crimes relate to an ongoing situation that they already had uh, jurisdiction over, that they actually can take jurisdiction um, over subsequent crimes. Um, I, I actually, to be honest, I really, I doubt that the court will uphold that interpretation if it actually comes before it. Um, it's, a, it's a stretch, I think, of the, um, uh, of the treaty's language. Um, I think that the, Philip, that the um, Office of the Prosecutor probably said that because there's little harm in saying it, right? Like they want, uh, the, the, um, the prosecutor, prosecutor's office often leaves these preliminary in examinations lingering for years at a time. Um, and, um, and even open investigation stages before they bring charges against particular people, those can sometimes go on for years. And sometimes I think it's strategic on the prosecutor's part because they want, the, they, they're hoping that the threat not yet carried out of ICC prosecution might affect events on the ground, right? Depending on what um, the situation is, if it's an ongoing civil conflict, then it might encourage the parties to, um, to come to the bargaining table. Or if it's just a, a government committing atrocities against its people, that at least the threat of prosecution might, um, might potentially deter those things from continuing. And so saying, hey, by the way, we still think we have jurisdiction over you, um, it might, it, it, to the extent that it has any influence on, situation, on the situation on the ground, I think they probably consider that to be a positive thing. Um, but um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical um, that uh, that, it, that it's actually true as a legal matter. Um, so um, the Rome Statute. So what are these international crimes that I um, say that the ICC has jurisdiction over? So the subject matter jurisdiction um, of the court extends to four categories of crimes: um, the crime of genocide, crimes against humanity, um, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. Um, that last one is um, uh, only some states have joined that part of the treaty. Um, so um, the thing that is um, relevant in this case is crimes against humanity. Um, so uh, genocide, um, while sometimes colloquially used to refer to just like mass killings generally, ge the legal definition of genocide is an attempt to destroy a, um, a group that's defined in, in particular discrete ways. I haven't heard that alleged in the, um, uh, in the Philippines case. Um, and war crimes requires an existence of an armed conflict, which um, could, you know, so a conflict between, say, a, a government and um, drug gangs could potentially arise to that level, but I also haven't heard that alleged in the, um, uh, in the Philippines case. Um, and so um, crimes against humanity is the, um, uh, and aggression is invasion of other countries, also not going on here. Um, so um, the, so crimes against humanity is the general category for um, 
peacetime atrocities, um, or peacetime or wartime, but, but in this case, peacetime atrocities um, committed um, by governments or by organizations that have effective control of an area um, um, against, um, against civilians. Um, and um, there's a list of specific crimes against humanity um, in the Rome Statute. The ones that I think are the most relevant here are murder and extermination. Um, so, and that's because, um, so there could be others that are relevant, but the, um, the media coverage as well as the brief descriptions that are on the ICC's website um, of the situation um, focus really on, uh, on um, killings. Um, and so these are, these are the crimes that relate to killings. Um, there could be in the fact patterns, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some other uh, crimes against humanity that come up, including um, possibilities are enforced disappearance, persecutions, that's if you're targeting um, particular uh, categories of, um, of people, um, torture, um, there's a general category called other inhumane acts. Um, but um, I'll focus now on, um, on like how you would prove a case of murder or extermination as um, a crime against humanity. Um, so first, um, the elements of, cri of murder and, cr and extermination are pretty straightforward. So the elements of murder are just killing another person. Um, and the usual defenses to it, like that if it was a, you know, a, a, say a legitimate execution as a result of a, um, of a trial um, and, and sentencing um, or self-defense, et cetera, those, those apply. But basically, the murder has its intuitive um, definition, right? Um, and then extermination is basically um, is basically a, a murder at scale. Like it's um, it requires uh, there to be a number of deaths caused. Um, and um, the there's no in the case law of the Yugoslavia and Rwanda tribunals, um, which is the main precedent in this area. There's not a clear cutoff in terms of how many people um, have to be involved before it rises to the level of extermination. Certainly, the overall numbers being reported for uh, killings in the Philippines easily exceed the scale of some of the um, extermination cases in the um, uh, in the other courts and in other ICC um, uh, situations. Um, uh, that might or might not be true if you were to focus on like particular incidents that were smaller um, in uh, in scale. So um, now. The complicated thing, of course, is that like not every murder that takes place is an international crime. So these states didn't just decide to give this international court in the Netherlands um, power to hear every domestic murder case. Um, instead, um, it's got to be shown to be a crime, um, a crime against humanity, and all crimes against humanity have to satis uh, ha the prosecutor has to prove what's called the chapeau elements, um, the, basically means the elements at the top of the definition, um, which is that um, the crime on the list of crimes against humanity, like murder or extermination, is committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack directed against any civilian population, and the individual has to have knowledge um, that uh, the attack is going on. So the idea here um, is that it's not meant to, like, crimes against humanity is not meant to get at ordinary instances of, say, murders, um, and it, not even ones that are, so let's say there's like a massive crime <coughs> wave, and so there's a big rise in the number of murders. Um, even so, the fact that they're sort of, they're not connected and there's no policy driving them um, would take it out of the category of, um, of crimes against humanity. So the, the um, Rome Statute further defines the widespread or systematic attack element to require not only a multiplicity of these crimes, um, but also um, a state or organizational policy. Now in this case, um, again, not an expert at all in the Philippines case, it seems to me that what is alleged here is clearly that there is a state policy coming from the top of the state um, to, um, to carry out killing. So I don't really think that those elements should be difficult, um, but um, uh, but just <coughs> just so you know, those things do have to be proven. Um, the target can be any civilian population. Um, so uh, so in general, victims have to be um, civilians, or at least the overall target of the attack has to be civilians. Even if like some military members, for example, might be uh, might be killed while carrying out the um, uh, the attack. Um, the any part is important. It's not like the crime of genocide or even the specific uh, 
crime against humanity of persecutions in which the, cr the group has to be defined in some particular way. So drug dealers generally, I think, count as a civilian population for this, um, uh, for this purpose. It doesn't have to be like an ethnic minority group or, um, uh, or something like that. Um, okay, so I'm running out of time. Um, I will just say um, there are other things that are um, considered is whether the, the local government is able to prosecute the case and willing to do so. The ICC does not step in unless that isn't true. I think that, that the Philippines is probably unwilling to, to prosecute its own government in this case, um, uh, um, at least as long as the current government um, exists. The case has to be of sufficient gravity to merit international jurisdiction. There can't be a double jeopardy bar. I doubt that any of those are likely to be major issues here. Um, so um, just to um, briefly describe like what's going on now, um, so the case is at the preliminary um, examination stage. Um, and that's when like the prosecutor based on materials that has been, uh, have been submitted to it and other information that it's able to gather. The Office of the Prosecutor has to decide whether all those criteria, legal criteria that I just set forth um, are met in order to decide whether it makes sense to go forward um, with a um, formal investigation. Um, the fact that they're engaged in a preliminary examination does not itself mean much. Um, the bar for initiating one is not high. Um, they're supposed to initiate it unless, uh, if, whenever like complaints come in, they're supposed to in initiate a preliminary examination unless something is manifestly outside the court's jurisdiction. Um, so the fact that they are at this stage does not necessarily mean they're going to move forward um, to a full investigation um, stage. Um, the preliminary examination has to be carried out with some limitations of information because they don't have formal investigative powers that states are required to comply with, like turning over evidence, um, in, um, unless um, the, uh, until the investigation begins, but they do their best to, to collect information voluntarily, such as from human rights groups. Um, and then the test for them to move forward will be if there's a reasonable basis to proceed. Um, the prosecutor has to decide that themselves, and then in, in a case where they have initiated jurisdiction on their own, they have to go to the pretrial chamber, which is a judicial portion like the, of the court, um, that um, will decide um, whether that standard um, is, uh, is met, and it's gotta be you know, based on the information that they then have um, available, and only after the full investigation is underway can they begin to build individual cases um, against uh, against particular um, people. Um, so um, again, I think they have jurisdiction over this few year period, right? Um, the Philippines is unlikely to cooperate with them. And, and actually, they may have no continuing legal obligation to cooperate with them. Um, the ICC could have generated a continuing obligation to cooperate um, if they had it managed to initiate the formal investigation before the one year <coughs> expired. I'm not sure why they didn't seem to push to get that um, done. That said, I think the Philippines would have refused to cooperate anyway, even if they had the legal obligation to do so. So maybe they just decided that it didn't matter. Um, okay, that's it. Still good morning, everyone. I am Justin and I'm a graduate student from the law school and I've actually served under two presidents, uh, the events of which I will discuss later. So. so I'm tasked to give an overview of the participation of the Philippines in the ICC and later on I'm going to give you a summary of the important legal issues because cases have been filed uh, when the current president unilaterally withdrew the country from the jurisdiction of the ICC. And as much as possible, I want to give little or no commentary because I served two presidents before. And so I just want you to look at the events behind the underlying events that I will discuss here. So in a nutshell, so the Philippine experience under the Rome Statute encompasses four administrations and the significant milestones are here listed here. But before that, I think I need to discuss to you these terms because in the Philippines, so we have different uh, domestic laws when it comes to accession or adherence to a particular treaty. So the, there are two pertinent laws in the Philippine 
uh, in the Philippine legal system concerning treaties. The first one is our constitution. But the problem with the 1987 constitution is that it only provides for the procedure for the concurrence, for the Senate's concurrence to the treaty. Everything, all procedures happening before that is not, there's, there's no particular, uh, the, the 1987 constitution is not particular of that. So what happened was because the president before President Estrada, President Ramos, in his capacity as a chief architect of the foreign policy of the Philippine government. So under his ordinance powers, he issued, he promulgated Executive Order 459 series of 1997. So that particular executive order provides for all the procedures prior the concurrence of the Senate. So part of this is the signing so the president under EO executive order 459 the president needs uh, the president will issue an authority to negotiate uh, to his uh, uh, to his representative in the in in the case of the ICC i think it was ambassador manalo who was given uh, the authority to negotiate and then after giving the authority to neg negotiate the president will give the full powers to ratify and then once he gives the full powers, uh, full power to ratify. He will sign the instrument of ratification, which he will transmit to the Philippine Senate for their concurrence. And then the regime of the 1987 Constitution will set in, which will require, I think, if I'm correct, two thirds of the member of the 24 members of the Senate. So this is what happened. So during the time of President Estrada, uh, he signed the treaty. And then there was no action on the part of President Arroyo. And then the pre President Aquino ratified the treaty and then the Senate concurred during his administration. And then the, pres the current president unilaterally withdrew from the jurisdiction of the ICC. So here are the, I think, pertinent facts. So during the time of President Estrada, he signed the treaty, uh, the 90, <coughs> excuse me, the Rome Statute was adopted by the United, uh, there's a United Nations, uh, body or a conference that adopted the Rome Statute. And then President Estrada signed it, and it was Ambassador Manalo who was given the authority to sign. And then actually, it was one of the last actions, presidential actions of President Estrada because a month after he was ousted from office. And then following the, following the US, United States policy was under President Bush. President Arroyo did not act upon the ICC. He, she neither transmit, she neither signed the instrument for ratification, or even I, I don't know, sign anything concerning the ICC. What happened was, so there was a group of senators who filed the case before the Supreme Court, asking the our Supreme Court to compel President Arroyo to via mandamus to uh, to transmit to the Senate the signed treaty of the. ICC. However, in the case of Pimentel versus Executive Secretary, the court refused to do that, saying that the president was the chief architect of foreign policy in the Philippines, so everything is executive. Prior to the 1987 Constitution regime, which talks about concurrence, all of those things are within exclusive presidential prerogative. So, uh, actually, uh, two years, after, three years after that, Michigan's very own Senate Senator Miriam Santiago filed the Senate resolution asking and impleading President Arroyo to transmit the signed treaty to the Senate for their debates, but nothing happened. So come 2011, February 28, President Aquino ratified the, the ICC treaty. He sent the instrument of ratification to the Senate and then following several months of deliberations in the Philippine Senate, voting 17-1, the Se Philippine Senate uh, concurred with the treaty and it made the Philippines one, the 117th signat signatory to the ICC. Now, this is, these are the events that happened during the administration of President Duterte. So sometime 2016, after taking cue from what he called as his idol, Vladimir Putin, he withdrew from, he threatened to withdraw, withdraw from the ICC and then two years after in March, he announced unilaterally the withdrawal of the Philippines from the ICC. Actually, when he announced it, he just uh, showed a s unsigned paper saying that he will be withdrawing from the ICC. So there was no, uh, there was no formal letter yet. And then he, uh, he announced it before that. And then after that, 
the several minority senators filed a case before the Supreme Court questioning the unilateral withdrawal. I will discuss the legal issues later. And then another petition was filed before the Supreme Court. It filed by the what they call as the Philippine Coalition for the ICC. So they filed for questioning the unilateral withdrawal of the president. What the Supreme Court did was to consolidate the two, the two petitions, and then the Supreme Court also ordered the conduct of three oral arguments. It happened in August, September, and in October, so the last oral argument was in October 9, 2018, and then several months after, because the uh, effectivity of the withdrawal will happen a year after, after, the, after President Duterte President Duterte announced it. So two days after, two days before the effectivity of the withdrawal, one of the petitioners, the PC, the Philippine Coalition for the ICC, filed an urgent motion before the Supreme Court as asking them to act on the on their petition, but nothing happened. So the withdrawal took effect on 17 March 2019, exactly a year after the president's announcement. So these are the legal issues. I think this is the main legal issue concerning the Supreme Court petition, the petition before the Supreme Court. They're trying to, there's an argument between, uh, in, with respect to this provision, if this provision is, an it, does it refer essentially to an executive function or is it also concerning a power which is shared by legislative? Because in interpreting this, this particular provision only talks about the concurrence of the Senate, but there is a merit in the argument when they say that since the Senate already concurred and with the treaty making it part of the law of the land, then you need to have an amendatory law in order for you to make it, make that in, may, uh, to nullify that particular to, make, to nullify that particular concurrence. So this particular amendatory law may be in the form of a Senate resolution withdrawing, from the, withdrawing their concurrence from the instrument of ratification signed by President Aquino. But there's also merit in the other argument where they say that once the Senate <laughs> concurs with it, everything, is be, everything, every, everything now becomes executive prerogative because the particular execution of the treaty is uh, forms part of the presidential's president's power to exec to faithfully execute and implement the law. So this this is the main issue in the core of the Supreme Court petition. So I'll be happily uh, answering your questions later. It's the one with the EJK um, file name. All right, uh, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I'm Tom and I will just be speaking very briefly to you today. Um, and uh, just a preface, I just want you to let you know that this is my perspective as a lawyer, was worked from the Human Rights Commission and um, as a law practitioner and a uh, faculty member of the law school in the Philippines. So, I will just briefly touch on three points. First, um, it's a brief statement on the drug war in the Philippines, so it's a situationer. So the narrative that I will present to you today is necessarily incomplete and abbreviated for so many reasons. First, we don't have a clear picture of what's going on based on the numbers and the figures, so it's necessarily incomplete. The aim is just to spark a discussion. And then uh, second, um, with the numbers and statistics, so I'm gonna relate that to some of the um, things that Professor Starr and Justin uh, talked about, uh, some of the issue of numbers and definitions in Philippine law, okay? And the third, um, about investigations, all right. Let me, pre okay, great, okay. So uh, that's the outline. So I'm gonna introduce the, the, the uh, war on drugs because not everybody is familiar with that. So I'll start with 2015. Um, at the start of 2015, there was a census that was conducted saying that um, there's around 1.8 million drug users in the Philippines. So that's a total of 1.8% um, of the population, okay? 
In the oral arguments before the Supreme Court uh, last month, the Solicitor General of the Philippines said that it's now around four million people. Okay, so do the math. Um, in May 2016, the president, uh, Rodrigo Duterte, won the elections. And then right there and then, in June 2016, actually I think it's in the, during his first day of office, he launched what you call the uh, do double barrel. So this is actually the legal basis in Philippine law. It's a circular, so it's an admi administrative uh, rule um, of what uh, uh, the, the tokhang is, so we call it tokhang, right? Um, so, but it's actually double barrel. So let's, let's see what it is, okay? It's actually composed of two things. It's just, like, uh, um, just to give you a, a brief overview. First is what you call uh, tokhang. So the double barrel is composed of two prongs. First is tokhang. Tokhang means essentially that um, Police officers will knock on people's doors, visit their, their houses. So that's the first stage. The, actually, the first stage is to first get information and then knock on people's doors, ask them to stop using drugs, ask them to surrender. Okay, and then there's another, and then some of, the, some of these people will surrender. And then after that, there's going to be monitoring. Okay, so it's actually a long process composed of five stages. Okay, that's the first part. The second part is what you call um, a, the one that concerns HBT. What is, what is HBT? This one is high value targets. So it's basically uh, the government trying to uh, reinvigorate their uh, uh, war on drugs against what you call pushers and high value targets drug cartel, so it's two-prong. <coughs> Not everybody knows about this two-prong thing. So, um, the killings actually began uh, before this was launched. And, but it was reinvigorated because of the launch of the double barrel. And the president also um, launched lists, what you call uh, narco lists, and uh, these are lists of high-ranking police officers, judges, politicians who are allegedly involved in drugs. And then um, um, we see that, you know, talking about politics here, in August 2016, the UN condemned um, the war on drugs because there's, there have been a spate of killings already. And then uh, President Obama uh, in the US called out the war on drugs. It's not So um, because of some of the controversies uh, surrounding the war on drugs, uh, the president had been you know, pushing, pushing the, 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 the barrel, so, so, so to speak. And then um, there was uh, some of the, uh, those people who handled the operations, it sort of flip-flopped between the police, the Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency, and at times the military was involved. And because of some controversies, the president stopped it for a while, and then it was launched again in October 2016, this time it's called Double Barrel Alpha, okay. Um, it, but it's actually an expansion of the previous Double Barrel. This one concerned um, police actually talking to places of work of people, uh, going into residences more. It's basically a more, uh, a, an invigorated uh, uh, Double Barrel operation. And then, um, again, because of some, some uh, uh, controversies, we now see that um, the president uh, suspended it because there was some, some of the killings were quite high profile at this time. So the president suspended it again, um, um, you know, and then um, in March 2017, he again launched it. It's now called Upland Op Double Barrel Reloaded. Okay, so that's the term. It's, uh, uh, it's a more extensive, aggressive, well-coordinated, but the president says that it has built-in systems that guarantee full accountability and discipline for the police. So what's the status now? Uh, the status now is the uh, police operations, the operations against the war on drugs. Uh, the war on drugs is actually coordinated between the Philippine uh, uh, Drug Enforcement Agency and the police. 
There was a time when the military was involved because the military uh, signed an agreement with the police that they will help the police. Okay, but the situation now is that. So um, in essence, the, uh, police na the police now continues upland to Kang. Okay, that's the first prong. And also high value target operations. Um, I just wanna, uh, before going to the numbers, um, I just wanna let you know that um, these are all laid down in uh, official documents, okay? Um, but I want, want to let you know that there's been also a, no, what I call numbers, the numbers of the crisis and the crisis in the numbers, okay? What do, what do we mean by that? So how many people died in the course of the drug operations in the Philippines? We actually don't know for sure. Okay, given the uncertainty as to the number of people killed, uh, there have been efforts actually to document the killings. I think they are important for four reasons. First is you know, short-term monitoring human rights violations. Uh, in the long haul, they will provide a way for us to evaluate the uh, drug practices of the Philippines, anti-drug practices. And third, it's, it provides justice and then it can heal the nation. Um, so what are the numbers really? Okay, these are some of the numbers floating around. Okay, the first one that I want to give you is the official government numbers, okay? Uh, it's called Real Numbers PH. It's a multi-agency task force. Uh, it was run by a multi-agency task force that released comprehensive figures about the uh, war on drugs. The second one is, is uh, drugarchive.ph, so you can all look at that. It's, um, uh, it's basically a collaboration between universities and Colum Columbia uh, School of Journalism. So there was an effort to sort of collate this information. The basis is publicly, information, publicly available information. The third is more of a mapping exercise um, uh, by a group of, uh, of, of NGOs that sort of wanted to uh, you know, map out where and how the killings happened. And then we have, of course, other sources. Okay, let's look at the numbers. Realnumbers.ph, okay, this is the latest that I got. Huh. They say that um, number of died, 5,281. Okay, that's the figure. And then you will see there that the figure is from the start of the presidency, 2016, July, to Feb 28, 2019. Or you see drug operations conducted, drug personalities arrested. Okay, I'll go to a next source. This is the drugarchive.ph. You can see that the information is incomplete, publicly available information. But they list that um, as of September 29, 2017, we have 5,020 cases. Many of them are in the capital region of the Philippines, in Manila. That's a hotbed. Okay, type, killed in police operations, killed by assailants, and also the list uh, if the body is found. Where is it happening in the Philippines? Okay, it happens right or around the capital of the Philippines. That's where ground zero is. Okay, this is, again, the third source of information. Okay, you will see there that they sort of plot uh, kinds of victims the, um, when, according to gender. Right? Sometimes they put some details if you click on some of the tabs. Okay, I want to share some, inf some you know, reflections on uh, what's happening here. Why is there a disparity of data? Why are we seeing um, some, of these some of these things floating around? The first answer, of course, is we don't know what's really going on because a lot of these are under wraps and um, some of them are reported by the, by the uh, media, some are not. And we see that there's been some form of media fatigue happening already because of the killings. Um, but the second more, uh, I think, insidious part of this is when we try to interrogate the definitions, okay? One, I'm a lawyer, so I'm going to put out the definitions here, okay? Professor Starr said that, you know, for the ICC, what's important is murder. <coughs> In Philippine law, we have two, at least two kinds of uh, killings. First is murder. The second one is hom homicide. But the question is now here, I think the one that plays with the uh, drug war is, is it self-defense? Okay, so that's the usual um, 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 what the police narrative uh, that they say that these people act, the police killed them because they, of, in self-defense of the police, okay? And um, 
All right, so these are the circumstances that will tell you what is self-defense, at least in Philippine law. But then the bigger question as well is what is extrajudicial killing? Actually, Philippine law did not uh, define extrajudicial killing until recently. Um, I think in February this year, there was, there's a law that's just passed. Uh, what is extrajudicial killing? But it is extrajudicial killing in relation to children in armed conflict. Okay, so it's very limited. So I don't know if we can use this sort of definition. Probably if, if killings happen in the course of armed conflict, probably that, that can be a, a way to do it. But um, we also need to keep in mind that uh, the previous administration had a, you know, not a very official, in, not in a very uh, formal document, but uh, I mean, in, it's just in preamble, that's what I mean. Defined it as one that's for killings of dissent and opposition leaders. And the bigger question here is, are these crimes against humanity? I think for the purposes of the ICC. All right, but I want to bring your attention to what's, again, another angle to this. The police say there are 22,983, okay, homicides under investigation in the Philippines. All right, what's happening here is um, what I call uh, a play on semantics, okay? Uh, they have what you call people who've died in legitimate police operations and people who've died homicides under investigation. So they sort of separate the two. Okay. I'll just briefly talk about human rights investigations. What's the status? Okay. Question is actually because the state has the duty to investigate human rights violations and killings. Actually, this is in the law of the Philippine National Police. They should investigate right there and then if there is a, um, actually section nine of Republic Act 8551, if there's a killing, they should investigate. What's happening here? Um, as of January this year, um, police have solved 327 cases. That's uh, the statistics. 79 cases have been investigated by prosecutors or are undergoing investigation. And then we have about, I think, two convictions. Okay. So I, let me just um, sh share with you that, tell you that there are a lot of unanswered questions here, not least of which is the question of numbers. But I assert that one killing is too many. And now is the time to reflect on the strength of the institutions that we have and the relationship with impunity. Um, I think international justice will help us here and local justice can also play a big part. Okay. But I stress that evidence is now crucial as we look and search for the real numbers and we fight impunity. Okay, I'll stop on that note. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for coming and I'd like to thank the Center for Southeast Asian Studies for giving me the opportunity to share with you whatever I can share in 10 minutes uh, about some, some of our, my, what I'm going to say, my conflict with what you're saying. Uh, but i like to provide a sociological perspective on what's happening in the Philippines. And the, assi the topic assigned to me is very appropriate. It was difficult for me to talk and write about this thing because when I prepare for talking about these things, I feel the pain of the victims of killings in the Philippines. Uh, and I have been in the Philippines as a Fulbright scholar in, in 2017. Uh, Paul and I have met those victims, uh, not only of the drug war, but also of counterinsurgency uh, in the Philippines. And it was difficult for me as a sociologist to talk only of the drug killings because the context is that there are three wars that Duterte is waging simultaneously. And this is the drug, the war on drugs, let's see, 
the war on drugs, the war on terror, the war against the revolutionary movement. And this simultaneous waging of war really has rapidly intensified human rights violations in the Philippines. And it offers convenience and conflating the war on drugs, the war on terror, the war against the revolutionary movement. And the latest rhetoric of President Duterte is that these three is our threats to national security. National security ideology has been used traditionally to justify the war against the revolutionary movement that's trying to change the system of oppression, exploitation in the Philippines that has been there for centuries since colonial times. The war on terror, for example, and the war against the revolutionary movement has been conflated. So conflating this offers a, a convenience in labeling. The war on drugs, the victims have been labeled as a threat to national security. This is now applied to them. When the victims, who are most of this, are innocent, are being labeled now as also obstructing development. And I will talk about that later. So convenience on labeling. Take, let me give you an example. The war on terror and the war against the revolutionary movement. Lately, I think you must have heard that there was a, a list that Duterte came up with labeling certain human rights defenders and activists and even the UN uh, human rights rapporteur in the Philippines as terrorists and that they are a threat to security. When you're labeled as terrorist, then you can be killed anytime. So this is, this is a problem, and I think you were right. Problem and definitions. So labeling is made convenient by waging this war simultaneously, and all these wars are supported by the United States. So let me give you some, uh, some figures which I found myself uh, from sources from Rappler, Karapatan, and the Commission on Human Rights. As of December 31, 2016, extrajudicial killings was 6,216. In 2018, there were 20,000 20, killed. Extrajudicial killings only on the war on drugs. In 2019, this was from the Commission on Human Rights, they said we estimate it now up to 27,000. So there is an intensification and an increase. Now some literature will compare this to the martial law killing. Uh, there were 3,240 killed during martial law from 1972 to 1981. And most of the victims, and this is where my heart really cries, mostly are poor people, urban poor, raids in slams. If you look at the law, it's very clean because that's the way legal things are written on paper. But when it is applied, where is, where is Tukang, right, happening? It's among the slums, the poor people. So that's why most of the victims are poor. Now let, uh, let a fact check. Duterte claimed that 300 to 4 million drug are, are drug users. Data from the Dangerous Drug Boards, 1.8 current drug users. Uh, 4.8 million have used illegal drugs at least once in their lives. So the approach and the model that we are seeing here is stop demand by killing suspected users. So there is, this is where human rights violations Come. And this is this created a chilling reality. Right? 
and using the coercive apparatus of the state to impose this kind of approach. So what has happened? Because I was assigned to talk about people's organized response, and I cannot name all, but I will focus on the movement against tyranny. I was there when this was launched, and I participated there. The Malaya movement, and I'm also one of the national conveners. I have some of um, my, uh, uh, some of you here are a part of that. And the International People's Tribunal, which is somewhat uh, different from the ICC. So this was launched, the movement against tyranny was launched in the Philippines in August 1917. There were about more than 500, the room was packed, attendees, uh, and this became the forum for the first time, at least from what I observed, the, for the victims of war on drugs to tell their stories with covert faces in their own country for security. Now give me that image, how will you interpret that? A citizen of the country of the Philippines has to cover their faces when they speak about their experience of injustice. And so this was a coalition that I thought that was beginning and I felt empowered because I couldn't know, this is so, I felt so helpless, what will I do? That this is the first time the drug victims who became Victims of the shock and oh, did this almost know nowhere to go. So priests, nuns, activists, professors, and all walks of life were there. The urban poor were there. Uh, Kadamai, an organization of urban poor, was there. So it was very hopeful for me. Now the Malaya movement is an outgrowth of the movement against tyranny in the Philippines. This was launched in February 2018 and intends to be a broad movement in the U.S. to stop the killings for human rights and democracy in the Philippines against the rising dictatorship and fascism in the Philippines. So in February, uh, uh, this year, this year April, April 6 to 8, 9, 2019, we had the first national uh, summit and we were very surprised. We had more than 30, 368, uh, uh, 368 delegates, is it correct? Right. And, and we did some lobbying after analyzing different issues was going on in the Philippines, including the drug war. We went to the, to the um, uh, to, we, we had lobby in Congress, you know, there, and then we were able to be visit at least 500, of, uh, no, 100 offices, five, uh, 50 during the day, and it was very enlightening for me to experience this kind of action because this was the first time it was done. And one of the questions <laughs> really was very, uh, senators and representatives of this congressman really began to open their eyes. And we hope that something could be happening. So what is Malaya trying to do here? That we want to end military aid to the Philippines. Because that is going to help. Uh, the, in, in, uh, because that is where the sustenance is of these three wars, right? And then, that we want a congressional hearing of human rights violations. This is the first time that you have a body united to ask for the Congress, who is, complete, uh, US, who is complicit in these human rights violations and it's through its military aid. First time we are asking, right? The movement is asking for uh, uh, congressional hearing. Then we have the International People's Tribunal. Some critics say, oh, that's a sham. But I was there as a delegate of Malaya. Yes. 
And the International People's Court is not a sham. It was organized by respected lawyers. And we had representatives of victims from different sectors, from workers, from the drug, from victims of the drug war, from the indigenous people. And they were telling the real stories, which you do not see in these papers, legal papers, which they cannot bring to the international court. They are poor people. They are ordinary people. They, can, they, they cannot go there. They are not lawyers. But we had international jury, and then we got their whatever uh, conclusion they have. We brought it to the ICC. This serves as evidence. Where is your source of evidence except the experience of victims of human rights violations? Now, what's happening, to conclude, is a dialectics of oppression and resistance. And it is this dialectics of oppression of oppress, uh, and resistance that create the crucible for change. If the international court, criminal court cannot come up because it has to be so legalistic in, in its interpretation of the law, then we need social movements to bring about change. And so what is happening today in the existence of these three movements that I have told you, and many others, is creating the crucible for change. Because there is this dialectic. The oppressors come up with a different narrative of reality, and then you have social movements who are also creating a counter narratives of the reality. So with, there is what's happening in here with these extrajudicial killings is the humanization of the victims. Let's take, for example, some, some statements from the president himself. The drug addicts are no longer human beings because they no longer think well, so you kill them. We do not have enough prisons to lock them, so you kill them. They are obstruction to development. Declaring war, this is, this is war. So you kill the enemy, they are threat to national security. What are the counter frames of social movements? Rise up for life, for rights. So we have now this movement of victims, families, are the real victims now, right? There is a movement now organized by Father Alcorvi, who was our keynote speaker in the summer. We want justice. No justice, no peace. Stop the killings, rehabilitation, drug addiction, a public health issue. Welfare, get to the roots of the problem. Eliminate poverty, kadamai. The Bourbon poor are saying this because I just read that the poor sometimes use these shabu because of lack of food, it makes them strong when they have to work in construction companies. There are no obstruction to development. What does the movement say? Neoliberalism is, the, is at the roots of poverty in class inequality in the Philippines. This was a whole theme in the Malaya uh, summit. The fascist state is the enemy of the people. It no longer protects citizens who are getting foreign, uh, fighting for rights, for change. And this is from the victim of the drug war. We, the poor, are treated differently. The rich users do not get killed. You have class issue there. Oppressors, tactics. Fabricated charges, so they use the courts. False news, so they close all <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, they are against uh, the, the right to uh, the press, repression of human rights defenders, working with victims of human rights. You could be, 
uh, say that you are obstructing justice for the police who killed the, the, ki the victims. Repression of activists and political action. So movements also use legal action. They all, but then the courts are also controlled by the, power f by, the, uh, by the machinery of the oppressor. Organize, create communities of resistance and struggle. Mobilize coalitions, alliances, I information campaign, education, consciousness raising, mass action and parliament of the street. If the courts can no longer give justice to the victim, then the parliament of the street, if the law is being used to oppress, and you can see in many, uh, many historical evidence that slavery here, was, the law was used to illegitimize the slavery, law is being used to legitimize oppression and killings. So the parliament of the street movements use them. Oppressor's goal. Preserve the system that will maintain their power. They want to preserve the system that trickles wealth to the few and the powerful. That's actually what is happening in the Philippines. And what's the movement's goal? Transform the system, create new structures, eliminate poverty and deep class inequalities, grassroots empowerment, and peace talks. I cannot go too much on these, but the peace talks can be legitimized by law by social legislation, which is comprehensive agreement for social and economic reforms, which will change the system that creates these three wars. Conclusion, it is the people's movements that initiate the dialectics of oppression and resistance. Oppressions want oppress, op the oppressed to submit. When the oppressed submit, there is no dialectics. It is the moment of resistance of the oppressed that creates the crucible for social activism to shape the chains oppression demands. And so the movements that I have focused here is an invitation for any human being who value human dignity, who will refuse to accept and submit the humanization to participate in this global movement that is emerging. And in this participation, in this movement against social justice, and defend the very basic human rights that makes us the human, gives us human dignity, is humanizing itself. That's why every time I am with the movement, I feel empowered and I feel humanized. And we should be in solidarity with the victims because they have been made powerless by the very system that should protect them. Thank you. So we can let people ask questions. Okay. Yes. So we can proceed now to the open forum. Thank you, Professor Ratner, for giving uh, way to uh, the open forum. If there's any question, uh, if there's any comment that you want to make, please uh, like um, be very direct about it. We're trying to save on time because there's another event coming up. Yep. Please. Uh, I think we have OJ with the mic. Yep. Yep. And we can continue our conversations afterwards. Yes, please. You can just identify yourself and proceed to the question right away. Hello, I'm Yuzuki Nagakoshi from, uh, from the law school here. Uh, my question is um, whether the ICC is an appropriate place to um, receive and prosecute such claims. Well, we don't have any um, human rights court in Asia. And, um, but it looks like a domestic law enforcement um, issue. And it's of, you know, there is a human rights violation, clearly a grave one, um, but it's a sliding scale whether, um, you know, so some domestic law enforcement here um, violates human rights. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems like in the Philippines it's significantly worse, but um, what are the justifications of bringing these things to the ICC and, and where, where are the other places that we can bring these um, yep. claims? Okay. So, I wonder who would want to answer that? Uh, yeah, we we'll probably have Professor Rat Ratner for that. Uh, the point of the ICC is to 
uh, prosecute cases of gravity where domestic courts can't prosecute. And so, as Sonia explained in her opening, the whole idea of complementarity is to give the court jurisdiction only when states are unwilling or unable to prosecute, which clearly is the case with the Philippines. Um, so I don't think there's any legitimacy problem of this tribunal, which the Philippines actually volunteered to sign up to. Now, we can have a broader discussion about whether uh, there's a sort of uneven application of the law because there are many important states that did not voluntarily sign up to this treaty. Um, but that's not really about the Philippines, which did sign up to this treaty. As for your question about other venues, um, that was actually what I was going to talk about briefly, which is to say that, in fact, uh, Duterte and his henchmen can be prosecuted um, once they leave office in the courts of other countries um, under universal jurisdiction. Um, and um, there are also non-criminal uh, penalties um, for people who, um, who don't face justice at home or in the ICC. Uh, the United States has a statute called the Magnitsky Act, which allows the president to impose sanctions on individuals accused of human rights abuses. He just did it a couple of weeks ago with regard to the people accused of killing Jamal Khashoggi. And so this is something that can actually be done without the Congress doing anything um, if the executive branch can be persuaded to use these. Now, again, it's not putting somebody on trial. It's not putting somebody in jail. But if you can freeze their assets and limit their, tra their travel, it can have a great uh, effect on somebody. Um, and so um, I think that the ICC is a perfectly legitimate approach. But there are other ways of going after uh, these people um, if the ICC decides not to go ahead or if um, the person um, uh, is not handed over. My last point would simply be uh, on the issue of whether the ICC ever actually gets custody of Duterte or anybody else, you really have to think in the long term about this. For many years, as Sonia can tell us, nobody ever thought that Radovan Karadzic and, and Radko Mladic would ever appear before the ICC. Mm -hmm. And eventually, they were found. And nobody ever thought that al-Bashir would appear before the ICC. And now he's in a Sudanese jail. We don't know what's going to happen to him, depending on how the situation in Sudan changes. So an arrest warrant may not be immediately implemented. But if one thinks in the long term, there's always the possibility of justice, even in the ICC. I, th I think we can take two uh, questions in a row and then let the panel answer uh, both of them afterwards. If there's anyone who's interested to ask any question, make any comment. Hi, my name is Ernie. I'm a community member, retired. Um, I'm wondering what is the end game that people are thinking after Mr. Duterte leaves office? You know, eventually he's going to be gone, and uh, what do you think will happen afterwards? Thank you. Yep. Any other question? We could probably have that answered first. Or, okay. Yep. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm <coughs> Mike Price, what's the bearing on this entire situation <coughs> of the fact that the <coughs> Philippine con <coughs> sorry about that Philippine Constitution pro pro <coughs> prohibits the death penalty and the <coughs> informal and official pronouncements of Duterte above and beyond whatever the legal ease involves are flagrant, flagrantly in violation of the Philippine Constitution. Okay, so there are two questions basically. One is about what's the end game um, and after the third leaves office or whatever. And then the second one is um, how uh, the question uh, relates to the Philippines not having any debt uh, uh, penalty provision in, in, in the Constitution. So I wonder if anyone's interested to, to answer that. We could probably have Attorney Tombrosa. So, uh, probably I can just answer um, about the end game, at least, because I know that. Um, the, uh, at least for the Human Rights Commission of the Philippines and some other uh, government offices, concerned government offices, the end game is to com compile and accumulate as much evidence as relevant and then hope for prosecution if necessary, after a president steps down. So, uh, th well, this, this also serves as an avenue for him to air his side and at the same time for, 
for victims' justice to happen. So that's uh, that's 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 one of the end games that I see happening, and probably also on the on the Philippine yes, Constitution. There's a yeah Philippine lawyer. So that one is uh, really tricky because the Philippine Constitution says that. Um, the death penalty may also be imposed. So it, there's a prohibition, but it may also be allowed So um, under certain circumstances. And so um, the president is saying that he wants the death penalty to be restored, but we, uh, it's, it's like reading the tea leaves at the moment. So we don't know uh, how and why it's gonna happen, but we also need to take into account that the Philippines actually signed on, uh, I mean, is uh, uh, ratified a an optional protocol to the International uh, Civil and Political Rights Convention, which basically bans uh, death the death penalty imposition. So, yeah. mm-hmm. any other question from the audience, perhaps? Yes, please. Thank you. What other individuals? We've been focusing on Duterte, quite rightly, of course. But what other individuals under Duterte? would be come up for um, judicial proceedings in whatever way. Mm-hmm. Very interesting question. I wonder if anyone's. <coughs> so like the focus of, of the campaign right now is like um, Duterte, uh, but is there any possibility of other individuals in uh, the Duter- uh, Duterte administration to be included? We've seen in the in the German case with the Nazis that we go after everybody all the way down to the pr- to the mm-hmm. prison guards. Yeah. So what are the people who are who are carrying out these policies that Duterte is ordering, allowing them to do? Yep. So I don't know. I'm not going to be able to name any individual people, um, but they, but I will say that in the ICC. Um, uh, although technically jurisdiction can extend all the way down to um, the, the p- any any person who's kind of carrying out an, an operation and not just the people who are ordering it from above. In practice, the ICC's approach to the gravity requirement has fairly heavily emphasized um, uh, crimes of senior leadership. Um, and so I still think it's possible that they could, uh, so that so long as the overall crime involved senior leadership, that they could try to prosecute lower level actors actors, but so far the ICC has not really shown an inclination to do that, which is very different from the Yugoslavia Tribunal, for example, which which did, did charge everyone from Milosevic down to camp guards, right? Um, I mean, they had to pick, they had to pick the uh, 180 out of tens of thousands of potential people they could have charged. Um, so the the camp guards that they picked were were pretty bad ones, but the um, but they weren't all senior leaders. The ICC has taken a, a somewhat different view, but that doesn't mean it has to be the head of state. Like there could be several layers of leadership below that, including um, military and police leaders, for example, that that uh, might be involved. Uh, we have a question here. Hi, thank you for your talk. I'm a professor at the School of Social Work. And my question, if things do mo- move forward with in terms of the uh, proceedings, is there a process for reparations or any justice for individual victims later on or at some point? In the ICC, there's a reparations mechanism. Um, now, in practice, um, so, so a- and there's also um, a uh, mechanism for victim involvement in the proceedings. In practice, um, large numbers of victims tend to be collectively represented by uh, usually like some kind of victims' rights um, groups. And um, reparations depends on, uh, so there's basically two potential sources. They could freeze the, a- freeze the assets of some of the potential perpetrators, um, which is maybe more likely if they go after you know corrupt leaders who have like millions of dollars salted away and some, some sort of overseas account that can be accessed by the um, uh, by the ICC um, the um, and and they could do that they could fr- if there is an asset like that they could they could potentially freeze it um, even if they can't get access to the individual themselves in the um, in country um, the the other source um, victim reparations um, so far there have been like voluntary contributions by NGOs and so forth to a victims um, reparation fund now there might be other reparations mechanisms outside the ICC that I, I don't know if Steve if you if you can think of, of other ways for victims to achieve relief no I think the ICC is just a means um, I just want to add that um, yes please I think in, in, in Philippine law um, there's two tracks 
first it's criminal prosecution. So even if the accused is not convicted, it's possible that there will be reparations because the bar for civil for the civil liability is lower. And independently, I guess that's a good question. There can also be civil civil suits for wrongful death. So that's a possibility that in case you know the the, the executive doesn't want to file cases. Because that's how it goes. You need a prosecutor to file cases in the courts in the Philippines. We can go that way. That's a, that's a good, that's a promising venue. But then it's not criminal in nature. Yes, please. And I think this will be like the final question uh, for the forum, but we will promise to continue with the conversations afterwards. Hi. Um, I have a quick question because, uh, and thank you for this panel, by the way. I recently watched uh, uh, Brillante Mendoza's Amo on Netflix that kind of depicts uh, the war on drugs in the Philippines. My question to you guys is if that's, I mean, I know art imitates life. Is that accurate? Because that was pretty brutal <laughs> what I watched. And uh, by having a, a platform like Netflix um, to humanize, to humanize and put from paper to um, a story or just to feel what's going on, is this helping the uh, the cause to push for the ICC to, to to bring awareness? That's that's just my question. Like, is this media? I mean, I I heard about the media fatigue, but to have a depiction uh, like Amo on Netflix, what are your thoughts about this as um, legal people? You know, so that's my question. Thank you. <laughs> I wonder if anyone has watched the film actually. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty good. I, I couldn't watch it. I, I watched it, but I was like, uh, it's really, mm. there, it's very nuanced. There's no protagonist. There's no antagonist. You just see how everyone plays out. And one of the, uh, one of the reviews on IMDb said that they actually listed all the news stories, and the news stories were the inspiration for the plots. Yep. It was just amazing how it was, they didn't even have to think of the plot. That was really the new story that they just sure. made. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's the, that's, that actually was the catalyst that brought my attention to this whole thing. You, you hear about it, you hear yep. my parents talk about it. It's one thing to do that and see something like that and then really be involved. So I was just wondering what your opinions are with having or, or like probably they can respond in yes. like, a, like from a very general point of view even without having seen the film. Yes, if that yeah. fits. To really be, uh, put our talents together to come uh, to documentation of this thing. And human rights uh, defenders and workers in the Philippines, this is what they, they are now trying to do because we cannot really sometimes rely on our people, statistics. So we have to come up and be creative, use our uh, interdisciplinary efforts to come up uh, with how can we uh, document these cases. And to go down into the to the areas where uh, sometimes are not even reached because some of these uh, cases are just reported cases. So we really need the help of all disciplines, from law, sociology, and all the other. Uh, if we can create uh, a network or a group that will help, because I still believe, and the movement is going to continue uh, pressuring also the ICC. And I guess we'll leave it at that. Uh, yes, uh, Justine. Yep. Yes. Uh, just an update <laughs> on the Supreme Court case. Uh, so several times the Office of the Solicitor General refused to provide the uh, uh, Philip uh, Free Legal Assistance Group and the Center Law. Those are the NGOs that are fighting for the human rights victim. The a complete uh, and accurate reporting about the uh, the what the Philippine National Police has done for that, but recent, just recently the Supreme Court has ordered the Philippine National Police through the OSG to, fi uh, to send the report of all of these things. And I think that may help in case building efforts of the flag group and center law, especially with respect to the ICC. Thank you so much. It's always nice to end with the silver lining, as it were. Uh, please join me in uh, thanking our amazing uh, members of the panel. Uh, let's give them a big round of applause. Uh